Good morning. Welcome, everyone. I'm, uh, I'm Senator Ginny Lyons. I chair the Senate Health and Welfare Committee. And I'm introducing myself, and then we're going, I'm going to have uh, Representative Lippert introduce himself, and we'll go around the table for introductions because I'm not sure that you know everyone. So. Good. Good morning, Representative Bill Lippert uh, from Hinesburg, chair of the House Health Care Committee. Uh, Ann Donahue from Northfield, vice chair of House Health Care. Lori Houghton from Essex Junction, House Health Care. David Gerke from Shaftesbury, House Health Care Committee. Peter Reed from Braintree on the House Health Care Committee. And William Page from Minnesota, Health Care Committee. Brian Smith from Derby, Health Care Committee. I'm uh, Senator Debbie Ingram from Chittenden County. Representative Lucy Rogers from Waterville Hall. Um, Rich Westman from Monroe um, County. Anne Marie Christensen from um, Lotusfield, and I'm on the House Health Care Committee. Rick McCormick, I represent Lunch and Jerry Mount Holly, and all of Windsor County. So terrific. And Thank you for being here today. Well, yesterday we had took a little dive uh, at the shallow end um, into the budget for uh, One Care, and today we're looking forward to hearing about quality metrics and how outcomes will be improved for Vermonters, among other things, and some of the work that you've been doing. Um, and we'll, uh, as we did yesterday, I think we'll listen to your presentation, uh, look at your slides, and then we'll, we'll stop and have questions. If there are questions of clarification, I think people will, you know, let us know and move from there. Uh, and just just to clarify that uh, I understand the Senate has, we have to stop, we're going to finish by 11.15 this morning. Uh, and so I, I'm going to just say that I'm very eager to hear about the quality and analytics and make sure that we have plenty of time. And if you, you know, the, you yeah. guys can stay here and, and listen. We're, we're, We'll let you do that. <laughs> <laughs> that would be incredibly generous to <laughs> allow us to use our room. Too bad. Yeah. <laughs> too, too bad we don't get a I know. <laughs> okay, thank you. Why, why don't you introduce yourselves for the record and um, we'll go from there. So thank you very much. It's nice to be back today. Vicki Loner, CEO of One Care Vermont, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues, Marissa Prusi and Sarah Berry, to introduce themselves and give a little bit of um, history with our organization. Good morning. I'm Marissa Parisi. Thank you. I'm in charge of technology today. <laughs> <laughs> very, just very good tech support. Very supported by our leadership here. Uh, I'm Marissa Parisi. I'm the executive director of Rise Vermont, which is the lead primary prevention initiative at One Care Vermont. Uh, we also have a couple of other initiatives in the primary prevention portfolio. Um, and I've been at One Care for about two years helping our Rise Vermont initiative that stands statewide. Good morning, I'm Sarah Berry. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for One Care Vermont. I'm fairly new to this role, but have been at One Care for four years now. Prior to this role, I was really responsible for all of our clinical programs and oversaw all of our analytics. So it would be my pleasure to talk you through some of the great activities and the outcomes that we are working towards. All right, so I'm gonna start off today, and I have a very light role for this portion of the presentation, so I think it'll move rather swiftly. And we're gonna move on to Marissa Parisi, who's gonna talk a lot about our prevention programs and our drug safe programs, and then Sarah Berry will um, start the presentation on the quality portion, as well as our clinical programs. And as always, we're happy to follow up with any questions or any additional data, and you know we're always willing to come back, so. I think the main theme of today's presentation, if you look at um, Jill Lord, who works at Mount Scutney for the Blueprint Program, is really what we're trying to do is start to work as a system together, and this requires us to collaborate across the system of care with primary care, our hospital systems, our communities, to really improve the health and welfare of Vermonters. So a lot of the work that we do is grounded in that and looking towards meeting the goals of the Alpha model. I just wanted to 
highlight before we started this that whenever we're thinking about what our strategy should be, what our programs could be, really thinking about what are the goals of the all care model and what are we trying to accomplish. And they're fairly lofty goals, as we've talked about in, in Vermont. Um, really go big or go home for some of these programs. And uh, increasing access to primary care, I think, is on the forefront of all of our minds. And as um, Senator Richard Westman pointed out the other day, it really is a workforce challenge in Vermont and something that we all have to be collectively paying attention to and how we can preserve that foundational um, body of work. Reducing suicides related to um, re reducing deaths related to suicide and drug overdose. Also a fairly large goal, working very closely and trying to partner with our mental health designated agencies, doing a lot of work with um, SASH, Sport and Services at Home in that arena. And then lastly, reducing prevalence and morbidity of chronic disease. That is one that really takes a kind of holistic team approach to be able to do better on that. Yes. Uh, just a, a quick question. So these three goals that are here, are these uh, are these the measurable outcomes that are embedded within the waiver between the state and yes. the federal government? I think that needs to be made very clear. Yes. Okay. These are the high-level goals um, as part of the all-payer model agreement between the state and the federal government. So what we try to do whenever we're looking at programs are what are those programs servicing um, funding supports that we could provide in furtherance of those goals. And as you know, they're pretty large goals. So what we have to think about are what are those process metrics and milestones that will ultimately get us to the, those goals at the end of the five-year demonstration. Yes? I have a question. Yeah, I think um, Sarah can answer that question, but we do, it is a statewide um, process that we are looking to test innovations, and so communities submit proposals to us, and they're evaluated by our Population Health Strategy Committee, which rep, you know has representation from across the state, but I'll give my is, is this something that we'll be addressing as you go through your slides? Yes, I do have a specific slide where we'll talk okay, about so some examples we'll, of those. Thank you. Line. Remember yeah. it. Yes. <laughs> and we're also happy to provide you with a listing of what those um, initiatives are so that you can see um, what's happening throughout the state. Yes, thank you. So with that, I think I'm going to pass the microphone over to my colleague, Marissa Creasy, um, who is going to first talk about the Rise of Vermont expansion and then go on to the Chelsea. Great. Thank you, Vicki. And thank you again for having us this morning. Um, my role at uh, One Care Vermont, uh, my title is the Executive Director of RISE Vermont, but our team based at One Care actually oversees the whole prevention portfolio because the goal at One Care is actually to have a plan for every person in our population. And actually, thankfully, in Vermont, the majority of our population are people who are healthy or may have an early onset of some kind of chronic illness. So the goal of our work is to really provide interventions in the community and in the environment because only about 20% of your health is access to health care and medical care. The other 80% is really about lifestyle, environment, are there any toxins in your community, do you have enough money to purchase fruits and vegetables that would keep you healthy. So our group is, is really out in the community working towards improving the health of the environment and the spaces where people live, including schools, work sites, municipalities, so that everyone has the opportunity for the best health in Vermont. So what I'd like to tell you in, in my time is, is more about the Rise Vermont work. That's the bulk of our work in the primary, on the primary prevention team at One Care. But we've also helped this year expand the Dulce program. And our work really falls under goal three of the, uh, of the all pair model in One Care Vermont. But um, I do want to tease up just to share very briefly about a project we're taking on this year that falls under goal two around suicide prevention. 
So let me dive into RISE Vermont. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with RISE Vermont, this is an initiative that started in 2015 in the northern part of the state as a partnership between Northwestern Medical Center and the Vermont Department of Health. And the goal was, seeing that we're moving to new payment models, how can we actually help support people in their homes, community schools, work sites, uh, in, in, even if you're in your local park, how can we have messages to influence health where you are every single day? So Northwestern worked with the Department of Health to build uh, on an evidence-based model to create RISE Vermont. And what they started to do was put uh, wellness specialists in towns across Franklin and Grand Isle counties to really start helping the community mobilize those health efforts. And given that, they had a very successful few pilot years, seeing good results in schools, great responses from parents, from teachers. Uh, at one year, we decided, wouldn't it be wonderful if our hospitals were a backbone for encouraging this type of healthy behavior, healthy lifestyle, healthy environment everywhere in the state of Vermont. So our team started at One Care in 2018. Um, we have a group of wellness specialists um, across the state. Our map here has shown our expansion, which happened pretty quickly. So when we started in 2018, we created a, a toolkit based on evidence-based model and the measurement tools we were going to use to start putting uh, program managers for Rise Vermont at hospitals across the state. And we've had a very, a really wonderful response from our hospitals. So in 2018, um, we added five new hospitals with Rise Vermont program managers. Uh, after that, um, this slide has things a little, so Brattleboro said yes in December of 2018 and started in 2019 um, in January. So Brattleboro started a little bit, we usually, I usually put them in the 2019 category, but last year we had three hospitals come on board and we're very close to being statewide. We have pre-commitments from Rutland Regional Medical Center, from Northern Counties um, Healthcare to work in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, we've been in conversation with Central Vermont Medical Center and the Broadway Memorial Hospital team is covering the Grace Cottage region. So we're very close to having a rise from presence in all 14 counties. And to just give you a sample of what Rise Vermont does and uh, when they get started at hospitals, when we place a program manager at a hospital that is going to help uh, work on Rise Vermont campaigns, what they do is they work with the community, and mostly they work with the incredible communities for health, which are representatives from across the community who are doing projects that uh, are really to invest in what the community's needs after they've done a needs assessment. So Rise Vermont is often the boots on the ground to be able to help move projects forward within an evidence-based model and with the community to improve the environment for health. And you can see here on this slide, um, and I'm happy to tell you more, and also I would encourage anyone interested in Rise Vermont to look at our website. It's a very robust resource that tells a lot of local stories, has a lot of local photos uh, about the work that we're doing. But here's a few samples. Um, the Rise and Walk program is one of our most favorite to share because one of the things that we feel like is really important with Rise Vermont, because there's so much good work already going on in communities, Rise Vermont provides the connection to the medical community, getting out, out of the hospital, out of their offices, and really in to the, you know, in your town with the people. So the Rise and Walk program is something that started in, um, in Addison County where all summer long last year, um, for I think it was about 16 weeks, there were physicians that walked with the community every single week, and the walks were advertised. The physician would talk about their particular specialty or give a talk on things like ticks and Lyme disease or the importance of hydration. Simple things, interventions you can do in your life, and it makes a real difference when you hear it from a doctor locally or you get to meet that doctor locally. And in Addison County, every time they hosted this walk, they had uh, the smallest walk was 40 people. They had between 40 and 90 people coming on these walks. So you could see that there was a real interest in getting out there, not only meeting the community, but having things that were sponsored and advertised in a route planned. So that's the type of work. Well, it may seem simple. It's incredibly important to ha have those opportunities in your community because I don't know if this has happened to anyone here, but it certainly happened to me. The day that my doctor said you should probably do these few things to improve your health, you feel alone, or you feel like you have to have an expensive gym membership or do things that are hard. What we're really trying to do is create an environment where good health is easy and fully wrapped around and supporting you at all times. So I hope you'll check out our website to, re to hear a little bit more about some of the other uh, projects we've listed here. So uh, oh, we have a question. Yeah, please. J just to clarify, because um, you know, statewide, because it's in every saying it or will be in every hospital area 
but it's actually limited to 36 communities. So it's, it, right now anyway, it's a lot narrower than it sounds. Am I reading that Thanks correctly? for that clarification, I appreciate that. It is in 14 counties, but you're right, you're not covering every town. And let me tell you a little bit how we select those towns, because I think it's uh, important. We realize that to do a really good job, we have to have a certain ratio of population to the people that we have working in the communities. And when we started looking at RISE Vermont and the Northwestern Medical um, Center team with the Department of Health started looking at doing a primary prevention program, they looked at different programs around the globe that were really successful. And we modeled um, our ratios around a program that's very successful in the Netherlands. And they used a ratio of one person, so one program manager, per population of 10,000. So that's kind of where we start. But then what we do is we look at all the data in the health service area by town, in including things like poverty, food security, um, access to fruits and vegetables, um, transportation availability, to then choose towns we think would need us most but then we inquire with the towns that they would want us. Because there's a really important readiness factor as to whether or not you would like to work with a new, a new initiative. Um, so that, and then in every town what we want also is to have them feel like Rise Vermont was born there. Right, that it's their unique initiatives, that it's their choices, their work that we're doing. So you're right, thank you for the clarification. Is there a list available somewhere? Yes. Which I, town? Actually, I have hands out, uh, handouts with me if, um, if members of the committees would like those after and it lists all the towns. So we have two more questions. Representative Rogers and then Senator Cummings. Yeah, thank you. Um, my question is, when we look at in rural communities who will come out to a community meeting, for example, there's clear demographic divides. And for the community meeting, for example, it tends to be people who are more affluent and people who are more left-leaning, just as information that I've come across. And I'm wondering, particularly with targeted communities that have like a readiness factor, I'm wondering how you're reaching everybody in the community and whether we're not putting money into something that's only serving a certain subset of the community. Yeah, I think that's a great question and thank you for that. Um, our program managers, their focus really is more lower income communities and what we're trying to do is be in as many sectors as we possibly can be. So in some cases, we may be at a senior center. In some cases, we may go right to a school meeting or a school board meeting. Um, right now, to give you a very specific example, we're helping the town of Huntington. They are looking to purchase a piece of land that would become part of the town forest. And we're really going almost door to door to really help people understand the importance of that and find ways to get them to the meeting that, that is being discussed. Define success because you talk about having a doctor come out and you have 40 people. Well, going out to walk with your doctor once in July and once in August is really not going to make you healthy. So, how do you, I mean, you have events and people show up, but how are you, what, what do you consider success? Yeah, that's a great question as well. So we are looking at a number of different factors, measurement factors, for the community itself at a population health level, but also at some um, smaller, more micro levels. Um, I also have a handout on this of all the evaluation measures we are using to define success and see how we're doing. But um, a couple of the things we're working on right now, so Franklin and Grandel counties, when they got started, what they really wanted to see as a prevention effort was uh, to focus on childhood BMI. So what they, have, what they started uh, two years ago, and it's just repeated itself, is a study that looks at BMI of first, third, and fifth graders in all of the schools in Franklin and Grand Isle counties. And what they're doing is they're going back to measure those cohorts every two years to really see if the impact that we're having in the community by improving the health of the community and improving the health of our schools is having a, an impact on that BMI. So that's one more micro measure. So define BMI yeah. for everyone, sure. please. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that is, it's a calculation that shows the height, that takes into consideration the height and weight of the children. So you're looking at childhood obesity. And we're looking at childhood obesity, and that the BMI um, shows overweight or, or, or obese. And we just put out a press release on what that second round of data showed, uh, and right now it's flat, which we actually think is promising. So that means there was no change from the first round of study to the second round, and what we anticipated was growth. 
right, growth in the BMIs of those kids, and it's flat. So um, no, decrease it. Yeah. No, absolutely. <laughs> right. I mean, at center lines, that's exactly the goal is to right. decrease it. And that's in the evidence-based model that we use over over about a ten-year period. There was a pretty dramatic drop off in communities that did this type of community intervention. But we're also doing key informant interviews within the communities with a researcher from UVM. We have a what's called a dose calculation, which is um, different types of community interventions you do within a portfolio that is shown to reduce the BMI of communities. So um, I'd be happy to share that handout with you. And we're also going to be at the Green Mountain Care Board with our researcher on February 5th, if anyone would like to be there to um, hear from the researcher the methodology we're using. One more. Yes, uh, you mentioned purchasing land uh, in one of your projects. Can you speak into the mic Cause so we can hear you? That would be great. Thanks. You mentioned purchasing lands for one of your projects. Um, does your organization work with other state agencies in that purchasing of lands? That is, you know, the Nature Conservancy and things like that. So let me clarify, we're not purchasing land, we're helping the well, children. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I completely understand your question, and I, um, uh, what we are, what is happening in Huntington, uh, to use that specific example, is the town, the municipality, has been looking at a piece of private land to purchase, which is behind the school, to provide public access. And yes, the Trust for Public Lands has been involved, um, different community groups have been involved, and what we've done is really tried to help educate the town of how great this will be, not only from an environmental standpoint, but a health standpoint. And what, we, what we're able to do, and I, um, this is a great transition into a key piece of the Rise Vermont uh, model, is that we're able to help provide uh, towns and community members with small grants to accomplish projects that they care a lot about that align with, uh, with the CDC's 24 strategies of intervention on obesity and overweight. Um, which is another way how we measure success in the communities. So in Huntington, um, if the town chooses to purchase the property and the voters choose to do that, what we are going to help do is provide signage for the trails right away to be able to have it accessible immediately. Um, one of the things we've done, even though I think people think of us as the exercise people all the time, we want people walking on the trails, but many seniors often only want to do a small part of the trail and have a place to rest. So us providing benches on trails across Vermont has been a huge access piece to just be able to get the older Vermonter community out onto trails. So it's that type of work we'll be helping hunting. Okay. So thank you for that segue. Because <laughs> uh, now I can tell you a little bit about the grants that we provide. So because we have one individual per um, health service area, for the most part right now, there's quite a few more program managers in the Franklin and Grand Isle County. Um, we have two program managers in Chittenden County. Um, but what they, what's critical for them is to work with other partners because all these communities we are working within, there is so much good work already happening and what all they need is a few more resources to get the work going even further. And that might be schools, it might be libraries, it might be a local nonprofit. So we have an amplified grant um, pot of funds for each area that we're able to help fund special initiatives for each community. Um, and since we started that, um, since we started at One Care with the statewide expansion in 2018, we've given out $223,021 to local initiatives. Um, this is everything from amphibian crossings, which I wouldn't have thought of as a healthy activity. I would have thought of that as an environmental activity. It was hugely important to the at-risk youth who applied for the grant. And now they have this project that they are taking a lot of care of, a lot of care of. It's pretty amazing. Um, funding snowshoes at libraries so that um, if you would like to enjoy the trails right now that are near, that are in your town, but you don't have the equipment to, to use those trails, you can go to your local library and check out a pair of snowshoes just like you would your library book. So that type of, um, that's, that's the type of project an Amplified Grant uh, can further. And again, when people apply for the Amplified Grants, they have to show us how they are um, meeting one of the 20, one or more of the 24 strat CDC strategies on CDC intervention. So while we are in those 36 communities doing the grassroots work, the real on-the-ground work, we do want to influence a broader cross-section of the population or health. So a piece of our evidence-based model is doing behavior change marketing, and you may have heard a little bit about our Sweet Enough campaign. So the Sweet Enough campaign um, 
is really to help Vermonters reduce their consumption of sweetened beverages. And the reason that we chose this is we did some independent research with a research firm and found that there are, uh, in Vermont, many Vermonters are drinking uh, about six, three to six times more liquid sugar than they should on a daily basis, which is contributing to heart disease, diabetes, chronic illness. And we pulled Vermonters, we worked with a firm to pull Vermonters, and they said, we would make a change in this health behavior if we knew what to change to and what would be a good alternative. So that's how we created this campaign, which uh, targets three groups of Vermonters. So you may not have seen the campaign if you are not a young man, a young parent, or are working on a, at a shift job, because those are the three groups of Vermonters that, it, that really that we really saw were drinking a lot of energy drinks, a lot of high sugar sports drinks, and especially kids who are on sports teams. They're doing this great activity, but then they're loading up with sugar after. So we really tried to, we really tried to target these these communities, and but with messages that are, are specific to them, so it's highly algorithmic. So if you, like I said, if you're not one of those folks, Facebook knows that, and if these ads have probably not popped up on your Facebook page. Um, but you may have seen our ads in movie theaters or um, on some of our social media. So the um, Sweet Enough campaign, we'll know if that's successful. We took um, a pre-measure of Vermonters about how much they were drinking, and we have already prepaid for the post measure. So after a year of the campaign, we will look to see if Vermonters are actually consuming less sugary beverages. So this is for a broader population than our, our small communities. So I think um, th I, that's everything for Rise Vermont right now, but I would encourage you to uh, have additional packets and that will tell you more about our evaluation methods, a little bit more about our programs, give you a snapshot of one of our communities. Um, but please look at our website to, to learn more about that, because I would like to tell you more about the the DULCE program. And I would like to acknowledge, I did not come up with the DULCE acronym, because I did, and I think it's a very wonky acronym. Um, <laughs> the one thing I tell people about the DULCE program when, they're, when they say, what's that, and what does it mean, I have a hard time remembering what the acronym is, it's at the bottom of the slide here. But I always tell people to remember that the L stands for legal, because this is what I think is extraordinary about this program. So very quickly, what the DULCE program does is it has a trained family specialist from the local parent-child center embedded in a pediatric practice so that when a family has a newborn, that family specialist goes to every well child visit with the family if, as long as they agree to enroll in the program and most do in the site where we have Dulce. The family specialist goes to all the visits, does an extensive social determinant screening and connects the family to resources, including legal. Now that is what I think is truly extraordinary because many Vermonters who might be in this program will struggle with things like um, an eviction, needing order of protection, needing certain small legal interventions that can make a big difference on the health and well-being of themselves and their newborn. So um, I have a separate handout, I'd love to share it, um, about how Delsa has gone this year. Uh, in 2019, most sites started up in, um, in set around September. Uh, we have Timberlake Pediatrics working with NCSS in, um, in the northern part of the state, two sites in Windsor, Windsor Mount Scutney Hospital, and Otakuchi Health Center working with the Springfield Area Parent Child Center and the Family Place, and then um, Timberlane Pediatrics in South Burlington working with Lund Family Center. So one care, um, our goal last year was to help Dulce expand to three sites. We were able to get into four in partnership with the Vermont Department of Health. And so far, um, 138 families and children have been screened in our part of the program. Uh, of, that, of those 138, uh, almost everybody has been screened, and we have about 75% of that population being referred to services. So it's already going very, very well. And to me, this is the ultimate in prevention. We're capturing newborns before any before anything bad can happen, before food security can happen, before anything you know anything that could get that life off on on the wrong foot. We are intervening then. So it's been a delight to see this program expand further, and we are continuing to provide funding for the four new sites into 2020. So we're really pleased with that. Um, and I know you want to hear about qualitative measures, so I will move it, move it along and say one last thing. Um, and I, did not, I don't have any handouts on this yet, or, or any information about what it's gonna look like. Um, so I'd love to come back if you'd like to hear more, but 
I have been very concerned, as has my team, since last year we attended an all-field team meeting that was sponsored by the Blueprint. And Dr. Delaney from VCHIP and um, the Warner College of Medicine, who reports on Vermont suicides, suicide rates, were there. And we just felt so compelled and concerned about the data that was being put out there, especially for older male Vermonters. And Tom Delaney at the time sort of casually mentioned a model, a prevention model that he had visited in, uh, in the UK while he was on vacation called Men's Sheds. Um, and Men's Sheds is actually an evidence-based model that started in Australia um, really to address the social isolation ma older males were experiencing because also in other countries people retire much sooner than we do in the United States and were feeling very disconnected from their community. So they created these social clubs where men could actually um, come and have meaningful projects to complete on behalf of the community. And what they found at the sheds in these other countries is that not only did it bring men together, reduce social isolation, but their health improved and the suicide rate went down. So we felt like, rise your moms out there. We have a great network. Um, could we create an evidence base for this project um, and based on all the literature and really create a sheds model in Vermont? Um, and we start talking to the Cigna Foundation about it, who um, is very, very interested in the suicide rate and, and mental health. So they really liked the Sheds project and have awarded a fellow, a, a Cigna fellow, to actually go on a paid sabbatical from Cigna as a Cigna employee who will work with us for three months to create some sheds across Vermont. So we anticipate hopefully next year having three sheds and Dr. Delaney is actually going to do the measurement um, through key informant interviews so that we can see some pre and post data on that. And, and so as you're talking about the innovations that you're doing, they sound very exciting actually, but um, one of the criteria or principles that we have in place within for the ACO is to access and utilize uh, current community people and programs. So you're talking about a shed, you're talking about hiring someone, are you talking about reinventing, uh, bringing in people who are already in the community who might have um, expertise in these areas? Thank you. That's exactly what we're talking about. Good. The Sheds program. <laughs> the Sheds program will really be a granting program. What we often do through Rise Vermont is make connections between between people and provide resources. So um, the Sheds model right now, our team who has put it together is Dr. Delaney from Beechip, um, our colleague Melissa Southwick from SASH, myself, and a team at One Care who does care coordination. And what we're trying to do is find um, different groups in the community who would find our shed master is what we're what I'm calling it. I'm not sure if the other sheds call it that, but but those core volunteers who really want to do this, or a nonprofit organization that would be its, that already has this idea and needs further funding. Uh, what we need to do is make sure that there is a model so that we can put it in place and measure it, but no, we're completely looking to get the community excited about this and provide that resources. I think as, as I'm listening as well, that one of the, I think a question for some of concern is that uh, one care not try to become the agency of human services, if you will, in terms of a lot of like What's the connection to the Department of Mental Health? What's the connection to the uh, uh, initiatives that are already going on around suicide prevention? So that so that there's alignment. I think one of the things we've talked about in our committee, just in terms of budget adjustment, is that so that there's alignment with already stated health policies and health goals and initiatives, rather than there being a new set of pre uh, prevention efforts that are not necessarily connected. Uh, to work that's already underway uh, with I other funding in the state I, agency. I'm not interested in being the agency of human services. Well, I, I, was, overstating, <laughs> I was overstating it for effect, but, right. but, but in fact, uh, I think, you know, frankly, yeah. there's, yeah. there's concern, there's some concerns yeah, about that. Yeah, right, can I get um, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I just want to both strongly agree and say, I think really what is important to note is that we are serving as an activator in it, for projects that are already planned 
by the community, which includes the Agency of Human Services and includes the Department of Health, and we just don't have enough activation or boots on the ground to move things forward, or, or a little bit of extra money to move things forward. And that's, I think, the gap we are filling. And we, every program manager for RISE Vermont works directly with the district director of the Vermont Department of Health who's working on the 3450 campaign, but they've set this beautiful model for reducing chronic illness and they have, and their work is to put policy in place. Our work is to mobilize the community around that policy, which wasn't happening before. Um, and that's why I think it's been so effective to, to actually have a person based at the hospitals to draw the medical community out and see the importance of this work happening in the community. I would just say that I think it's also, it, perhaps short term and long term, it's going to be important that the connections that you've articulated here some degree of the direct, the underlying research or the underlying reason to support some of these activities is directly related to changing health outcomes in communities. Because it has the potential to simply sound like, uh, well, this is a great idea. We need snowshoes in our library, so let's go to one care and get snowshoes. And I think that actually is going to undermine uh, the support <coughs> rather than enhance it. So I think, I think there, there, there's a messaging piece here that that's actually quite important. I just want to add a little bit to that um, in terms of us thinking about this as a really great public-private partnership. So we have been working with Agency of Human Services as the policy arm for a lot of these things and saying, what are those goals that you're trying to achieve and how can we as a delivery system support you in those efforts. So I think about this as a good partnership and that we, again, the overall goals are working together to be stronger and this is a real commitment to doing that. And I, I think you'll see when you even look at some of our boards, we had the Commissioner of Health on our Population Health Strategy Committee to be able to kind of bring these things full, fully forward. And the so, last one, I'm, I'm going to ask if it's possible that we yeah. move on to yeah. quality metrics mm -hmm. and analytics. We Can we do so. that? Because I, the, the Senate needs to hear some of it. Yes. And then uh, we're going to leave and the House has got you. Mm -hmm. We're going to do a little shuffling right now. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Sorry, some of us are more Thank Good you. morning. Again, I'm Sarah Berry, Chief Operating Officer for One Care, and it's my pleasure to talk to you this morning about several components of the work that is happening through our provider network. And, and by providers, I just want to remind us all we're talking about the whole continuum of care. So individuals that are supporting Vermont citizens, whether they be in a skilled nursing facility, utilizing home health services, able to be um, in their home, in the hospital, or accessing primary and specialty care services. And so, as you can imagine, that's a, a wide breadth of providers, of issues and ideas that come up. And part of our job is to listen to all of those perspectives and try to bring them together and organize the priorities and use the framework of the all-payer model and those three population health goals to really help guide uh, the priorities and the work that we're doing. So I think it's important when we think about first the quality, this is really how do we assess the impact of this work that is happening in healthcare reform through the avenue of an accountable care organization. And the way that we do that is to structure a systematic data collection process that happens by collecting direct information from patients, so surveys of patients across the state happen every year. In addition, we go in and we actually have to have some staff who collect information from medical records where the data aren't otherwise accessible, things like people's blood pressure or what their blood sugar level is so that we understand how well we are as a community are caring for and supporting uh, individuals and populations. And then we also, um, are able to collect information from the billing data, from claims that come through the system. And, and of course, that would be our preference because from an efficiency standpoint, it's much easier to then aggregate that information than have to go look for every single piece of data. But it's really important that all of that information come together into a lens or a perspective on how is healthcare being delivered in Vermont specifically and under the Accountable Care Organization. And so as that occurs, that measurement happens every year, 
And there are lots of kind of underlying caveats. I'm not going to go into all of the details today, but I do think it's important to recognize that uh, one care is still growing. Every year, more and more Vermonters are coming into this model, which does, from a measurement standpoint, make it a little bit challenging in these early years to be able to compare kind of year one to year two. As we have more and more people and more and more communities in the program, that in the future years will get easier to do year-on-year -year comparisons. So across the top of this slide, you can just see in aggregate what our quality performance looked like, about 85% for Medicaid, 86% for the individuals on the Blue Cross Blue Shield exchange program. I do want to note that 100% for Medicare is a technicality. That is because it was the first year we were in the new um, ACO Medicare program, which means as long as we submitted all of the data they asked of us, we kind of got the check mark or the check plus. So we wouldn't expect that to be 100% as we look at the 2019 data. And in fact, if you think about the measures, which we've just listed out, I apologize for the small type, um, but this is actually the totality of the measures that the providers are paying attention to right now. And they focus on things in uh, childhood, like are adolescents coming in for well care, which is a good proxy to understand whether they're receiving things like depression screening, whether their weight is being checked, whether uh, there's discussion of healthy behaviors and emphasis on their strengths, all the way through um, are certain types of cancer screenings happening for older adults. There's a, a whole host of mental health related measures as well. And one of the things that we've really been focused on in thinking about these quality measures is how do we help providers who, as we know, are very busy uh, caring for patients and, and having to uh, do their paperwork and, and serve on, in other community-based settings, how do we help them identify areas of opportunity? What are the gaps where maybe performance isn't as high as it could be and, and maybe there's an opportunity to improve? So when we looked at the data for 2018, a couple of the key things that stood out to us is that from a survey perspective, patients reported that they felt that the communication they received from their healthcare providers was very effective. They felt that they actually had good access to primary care services and that the care that they received was well coordinated. So I think those are three really important uh, perspectives from the voice of consumers, our Vermont citizens. We also saw that there are some variations. So for example, when we think about chronic disease management, individuals with diabetes who have Medicare insurance actually are doing quite well. Their diabetes is well controlled and supported, but when we look at some of the other populations in the state that might be insured through other programs, that might not consistently be happening. And so when we think about some of the gaps, that's one of the areas we're drilling into with providers. How do we look at things like hypertension, so high blood pressure, diabetes care, and make sure that the high quality care that might be happening in certain areas really gets spread across the entirety of our provider practices across our communities. So we have a question here from Representative Donahue. I, I'm looking at, at the quality measures and, and sort of wondering where they come from because obviously if, if the bar is too low, then success is not really success. And you tend to focus on things you know best about. And so I look at, you know, somebody has had such an acute mental health crisis that they went to the ED. And it's quality if within 30 days after that ED visit, there's been follow-up. That to me is like stunningly not quality. Thank you so much for the question. I agree it's really important to understand where this comes from. These are not locally grown measures. They are all nationally validated measures that come from various sources so that they can be benchmarked or compared to um, other regional or even national populations. And that helps us understand, are these the right measures? Because to your point, if uh, we were getting high quality scores across all these measures, then perhaps they're not the right things to focus on. And in fact, Part of my early work at OneCare was to look at what was at the time a list of 70 different measures, which providers found impossible to identify where to focus, and to really ask from a clinical perspective what is important, to ask from a data perspective where are the gaps, and then to partner with the Agency of Human Services and say from a policy perspective, as the all-payer model is was being negotiated and then moving forward, what are those key focus areas? So you'll see there are five core mental health measures. Those really are um, process measures related to trying to get to that reduction in deaths due, due to suicide or drug overdose. 
in every one of these areas, there is still significant room for improvement. If these were easy, um, we would love to have kind of checked them off and moved forward. We see um, from a data standpoint that there's still tremendous variation uh, across communities, and that's a big part of what we're trying to use our data to highlight and to help communities improve by facilitating the discussion of, well, if in Bennington this is going so well, what are you doing that's different or unique, and how do we share that with folks in uh, Franklin County? for example. And so you can segregate out by uh, demographic, you can segregate out by um, private versus public So insurance. all of our, we do monthly reporting on all sorts of uh, what we would call kind of cuts or, or subpopulations of the data, trying to understand where are their differences and then what do we do to get rid of those differences. So uh, I'm, I'm probably going to jump ahead a little bit, but so when you have that information and you see that the patient that's with Blue Cross and Blue Shield is getting, um, is not having the outcomes that we're seeing with Medicare, then how do, how does that work? I mean, it's an insurance company. They have specific outcomes themselves. How are you improving the quality of care within that private organization? And I, I, I ask that question because I know that we're trying to gather more attributed lives from our self-insured folks. And if it does, will this improve the outcome, outcomes for that group of people? Huh? Thank you for that question. A, a specific example I can give you uh, related to your Blue Cross Blue Shield population question is that we have, as we start to track who is utilizing or accessing primary care services in these different populations that we might define, in this case, by insurance, we know that um, it tends to be a lower use of primary care services for uh, people who have their insurance through the health exchange. And so we had that conversation uh, with leadership at Blue Cross Blue Shield and, and our clinical leadership at One Care, and we started to say, well, what can we do differently? Because about, I mean, does it does it relate to the out of pocket um, and it, other deductible costs? It could. It could, with those it could relate to communication. Like, do do I know that my provider thinks it's important that I come and see them at least every year, and that what's the value of that relationship and that connection? So. Because we are a provider-based organization, what we really looked at is how do we look both at financial incentive alignment with what we want for the clinical outcome, and we together with Blue Cross Blue Shield designed a program that we started piloting uh, late in 2019. We targeted nine different uh, primary care offices that were interested in working with us. We provided them with a toolkit, and we said, let's get a little creative. What are some new or different things that we might do for you as a practice to outreach to patients that aren't coming in and to help them understand what is the value, why is that important? And we don't have the final data yet, but my team has been tracking it really closely, and it looks like we're starting to make a difference, that some of those individuals that traditionally were not connecting are now seeing a primary care provider. Now, this is a long-term game, right? Like this is, we want to create a relationship, we want to establish trust in that provider relationship, and then we want to maintain it. So our intention is to take some of the early things we've been trying and spread them more broadly in 2020, and then be able to evaluate whether that strategy in particular is working. Other things, just to highlight very quickly, um, this is a great example of where One Care staff and Blueprint for Health staff work very closely together in supporting practices and identifying in this practice, maybe we have a, a healthcare gap around diabetes care. And in another practice, maybe the issue is really around early developmental screening for young children. And so then there are targeted evidence-based approaches that we gather both nationally, because there's a lot of work that happens across the country in these areas, and also, uh, to the earlier point I was making, really, how do we find out what works in one local Vermont community and share that information? And so we have a whole host of things that we do to share that. We create one-page network success stories where we give people credit and say, what is it that worked and what didn't work? Because we can learn from that as well. We host clinical grand rounds where we have people come together across the network to say, this is how I've done it, these are the results that I've been able to show. Here's a patient or caregiver perspective on how this felt and what I appreciated and maybe what didn't work for me. And then we ask 
those uh, people to go back and think about how that might be implemented. And we have some really nice examples starting to emerge of how some of those early stories that might have started in Berlin spread to Morrisville as an example or vice versa. So just briefly, we've started to talk about the data, and that really is a critical cornerstone of uh, ACO activities. I would say from my lens, it's right up there at the top with thinking about how we support every individual in a population health approach. And so I do want to acknowledge, and I understand there's been some conversation in, in previous days, that the types of services we're talking about here are potentially things that hospitals could do. Um, but that we believe and our provider network believes can be done more efficiently and with more uh, sophistication and, and more efficiently um, when done centrally through an entity like the ACO. And that is because I will just say that the data that come in are complicated, they're often messy, they need to get normalized, so the data that comes in from one payer might come in in a different format than another and we have to make sense of all of that information. And then it's our job to meet the expectations of our network. And that means turning around data in a really timely fashion, making sure that it's actionable information. And I would say that's been really a focus area for us in the last year and as we move forward. I'm really identifying not just how are we doing with cost or utilization or some of these quality measures you saw, but what can I do differently because I now have this information. And so one of the areas I will show you in a few minutes really relates to how we started to look at and track use of the emergency department for individuals that are high risk. And I think in part, along with other interventions we were putting in place, watching that data every month and saying, oh, what I'm trying is making a difference. These emergency room rates are going down or they're not. What else do I need to do? So, Marissa did a, a nice job of really talking about our primary prevention activities, but I wanted to put that in a broader context for all of us today to really recognize that from uh, One Care's perspective, we do want to make sure that we are thinking holistically about how to care for the entire population that we touch. And the way that we do that is to try to break that very kind of overwhelming concept down into some structures and some ways that we can create language and priorities around the populations. And so we use, we call this our four quadrant model. This is our population health approach. And in it, what we're saying in the middle of the circle is that in general, we can use the data that we have to preliminarily identify and predict whether you are healthy and well, or whether you might have a chronic condition, but that chronic condition is pretty well under control and you're managing it with your healthcare provider. Those are those category one and two that you see at the top. And then in category three and four, these are individuals that um, in category three, for example, um, might be struggling with one or more chronic diseases. Oftentimes what we see is there is a very um, real intersection between physical health needs, mental health needs, and social needs in this category. And so um, one of our uh, former board members from a designated agency labeled this for us kind of the rising risk category and argued very passionately in One Care's early days that this was probably the greatest area of impact that we could have. And that became a cornerstone of really thinking about how we define some of our interventions and specifically our complex care coordination program. So that when you get to category four, um, that is, some, uh, is a, a category that represents um, very acute needs. And those could be very rapidly changing. That could be somebody finds out that they need a liver transplant. Mm -hmm. Somebody has a really bad car accident or a bad cancer diagnosis that they go from yesterday thinking things are going well to today all of a sudden I have tremendous needs and, and I need to draw upon resources really not only within healthcare but also oftentimes across the agency of human services as well. And so we have put as an accountable care organization tremendous focus on that population, what we call our top 16%, that rising risk and that acute population. And if you just focus for a minute on the box at the very bottom, these are brand new data that just came out for us this week. But we looked at within that 16% of the population and we saw that the, they account for 60% of all of the healthcare expenditures within the accountable care organization. So did you say 16% or is it 6%? The population is 16%. So the arrows going both ways are representing the top 6% in oh, okay. category it's, four it's, plus it's the, the 10. It's the two bottom. It is okay, the two I'm bottom. I'm sorry. I, Thank yeah. you. 
So within that 16%, um, which is, uh, I don't have the exact math with me, but I want to say that's about close to 24,000 lives. Um, again, 60% of all of the, the healthcare expenditures within that population, 95% of them have more than one chronic condition and over half of them have a mental health condition within the last three years that has been documented through claims. So that doesn't even speak to those that might not be recognized yet. And so again, you can see there are complex issues here, um, but this is really the overarching framework and the way that we connect all of our partners in the community across the healthcare system to say, what are the strategies we need to put in place and how do we have a diverse portfolio so that while well, we're focused on, let's say, um, hospice needs of a, a particular population, we're not forgetting about prevention needs of another population. The care management of those two groups is, must be um, complex. Complex, absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. That's actually a perfect segue. So, I talked about our population health approach. This is uh, just a graphic to help illustrate our overarching care model. And I'd like to start at the center because the center of the model is all of us and our families and our neighbors, we, the Vermonters that we are serving through this model. And so, we then need to think about what are the individual and group needs within that? What do I care about for my health and well-being and what is important to me? Not what does my health care provider think I need to do, um, but it might be, you know, my goal, um, let's say after a heart attack, might be to walk to the end of the driveway or to make sure I can get to that graduation. That could be very different from um, what a health care provider might give you as a statistic that you want to achieve, let's say, for your blood pressure. So the second, uh, the middle part of the circle, really represents all of those partners that we're bringing together through the ACO. So you can see, I've mentioned uh, the blueprint, our mental health care providers, our specialists caring for um, individuals with some of those chronic conditions, our hospitals, SASH, and so on. Every one of them are integral to this model and to its success. And then around the outer rim, this is really the, the backbone support that OneCare as an accountable care organization provides at the request and to help support the activities that that center ring, all of our healthcare providers are delivering. And so that consists of education, tools, the data we were talking about, funding opportunities, whether they be for innovative ideas to be tested or amplify grants in local communities. So to the earlier question about innovation funds, in 2019, OneCare's board uh, set aside roughly a million dollars to uh, listen to the ideas of community members around where there were what I consider to be kind of the sparks of great ideas that just needed some funding and an evaluation to test whether these ideas had the potential to improve care, to improve uh, cost, and very importantly to our population health strategy committee that oversaw this, do they have the potential to be sustainable and scalable? Because there could be a wonderful project out there that frankly has no chance of going anywhere after its funding period and that was not something that the population health committee or One Cares board felt like was the right and responsible use of funds. So some of the projects, there were two rounds of funding um, and a open request for proposal process that again was led by our Population Health Strategy Committee. They made recommendations to One Care's whole board and uh, the projects for 2019 have now all been funded. These are a subset of them um, from a little while back. Some of the things that the committee prioritized in and set out um, in that initial RFP were things like we want to see collaboration. So if you're asking for a larger amount of money, you need to have partners coming together in this common vision for how the work would be accomplished. There was a focus on um, mental health, a focus on chronic disease management, um, and again, critical questions about how would we know if this is successful, do we think it could be scalable, and do we think it could be sustainable? And so just briefly, um, one of the ones that I personally am just so excited about is the, the Youth Psychiatric Urgent Care Model. This is down in Bennington. It's actually got an acronym called PUC right now. And this uh, really came about because physicians in the emergency department 
at Southwestern uh, Vermont Medical Center were identifying that while they had received some training to provide trauma-informed care in the emergency room for children, that they remained very concerned that that was not the right setting of care for children in, um, with mental health needs. These in particular were kids that were um, being transported from their school to the emergency room because the school couldn't deal with it any further, that there were really significant concerns. And when they shared the data with us, in one quarter that they had tracked it, I believe there were close to 300 kids that had been transported in just a three month period. And so they came Who forward. Who was transporting them? And oftentimes the police. I was just so going to say, the would call get, the get into that whole area exactly. of the world. Oh. And so our job was to really look at one segment of this through this proposal, and it was to look at how could a partnership with a local designated agency, so the mental health care services, help eliminate the need to bring those children um, into the emergency room. When I went down to visit, one of the most shocking components of that to me is that most of the kids, they weren't adolescents. They were elementary school age. Oh. And so this program has been up and running since the beginning of the school year. And it was intended to start just in one elementary school to pilot it. They've already spread it to additional because they are seeing the impact so quickly uh, that is happening. They have um, developed a uh, a child, adolescent, family-friendly um, area where they, the individuals can receive one-on-one -on -one services and supports. They often have ancillary things that they do. Um, they, they bring the family in and do cooking classes together as part of this. And the goal is to get that child back to school as soon as they're ready and to really have the mental health care providers in collaboration with the family evaluate that. So early days, um, that will be funded um, over the course of 2020 as well, but really excited about that as one example of the types of work we're doing. We do have another handout that we could provide you in follow-up that goes into more detail about each one of these programs. How long has this been going on? 2019, so the first okay. round was funded in uh, May of 2019 and the second round in September. Okay. So when you're getting the data we are. So we have uh, reporting requirements and evaluation metrics written into the contracts for each one of these. And so, you know, the, the story I was just telling you about the program in Bennington comes out of their reporting to us around what they're doing. And they do have counts for us of how many children have been um, supported through this program. It'd be kind of neat to see a longitudinal analysis uh, of, the, of the kids. You know, the program is one thing, but I mean, just the kids over time. Absolutely, and, and we might not have a full lens into yeah, that, but exactly. the thing that we've committed to partnering in the evaluation framework is to say, okay, if we are keeping these kids out of the emergency room because that's not the right setting of care, then we can look at cost go down mm -hmm. and see, is this the way to make this a sustainable program? Is a long-standing partnership between the hospital and the mental health agency the right way to move resources around to provide better care and outcomes? And that is really the underlying framework for a lot of these projects. Okay, so I want to share with you uh, just some early data that we have. This uh, improvement story comes out of Central Vermont, the Berlin Health Service area. And in particular, uh, this is thinking about our quality measure performance. So we talked about diabetes care and the fact that there's some variation across uh, different communities. This measure, um, just to decode it for you, is looking at how many patients who have a diagnosis of diabetes have had the right blood sugar test in the last year. And that is a, a measure that from a, a data and a systems perspective, because that requires a lab um, test to do, we can then track how often that's happening. The graph um, is really important. This is an example of some of the ways we provide data to our provider network. And so what you're seeing here is that the dots represent every month. And if you look vertically, that shows you the variation from health service area to health service area. So if you looked at April 2019, you can see that one health service area might be performing about 82 or 83 percent and another up at 94 percent. And so that's part of what we try to do is identify, again, um, that variation and try to narrow that down as appropriate. So the green dotted line represents one CARES average, our providers on average, and you can see that this is something they've been paying attention to, and so you're seeing that graph go up. 
But the blue line, really interestingly, is the, the work that is happening in Berlin. And you can see, not only is it going up, but it's consistently above that of the one care average. And so we said to the, the team, this happened to be through CDMC, the local hospital, what is it that you're doing specifically that you think is impacting these rates? And they came back and said, we're doing two very specific things. We're doing something called panel management. And what that means is that there is a staff or multiple staff members who are going ahead of time and looking and saying, well, who has diabetes, who hasn't been in for a visit, who hasn't had their lab test? Can I actually set up a process to get those labs ordered and call that um, individual up and help them understand why they should get that test and have the doctor read it? So that was one component. And the second, from more of a financial perspective, is they said, as a hospital system, so looking at the um, employed primary care providers, we want to align our provider incentives. So there's actually a financial structure associated with the, the pay that the doctors receive associated with achieving higher performance in this measure. So just one example of the types of activities that are going on. Um, so, and we can take this offline. So when you gather this data, for instance, from Berlin, um, I want to make sure I'm understanding this right. Are you then going to the other HSAs throughout the state and saying, hey, this is what Berlin is doing and this is what we're seeing. You know, this is your panel of people and this is how you could increase your numbers. Absolutely. Okay. And so every month, graphs that look like this come out in a report. They're shared within anyone who is contracted with OneCare. So home health gets to see this in Berlin as well, okay. uh, for example. And then what we do is we look for who are the really high performers and how do we highlight and share that? And then who are the low performers? And that's often where our staff will go in. So an example there was in one community, um, we had a, um, a large practice join us last year and we saw that they had a much lower rate of adolescent welfare visits than anyone else around. And so, you know, there was no accusation that we came in with curiosity to say, what's happening here? And, and it turned out there were some system issues within the office where, in part, they were doing things that weren't well documented so we could fix documentation. And then we had some really good conversations about, well, who do you consider to be patients in your practice? Who do we consider to be patients in your practice? And how do we come together in, in a more holistic way to think about the support of the community? So primary care, um, a really important cornerstone of the entire uh, framework of the ACO model and, and certainly as we think about um, how we want to provide access to services for all Vermonters. So in this snapshot, uh, what we're showing you is on the left, when we survey individuals, um, we ask the question, how satisfied are you that you're receiving timely access to primary care? And the Medicaid um, surveys came back and said, usually parents or adolescents who are old enough to report on the survey themselves, 94% replied that they were satisfied um, with that uh, access to care. And you can see for adults, we gave you both the Medicare and Medicaid rates. We also really want to, to focus on the high and very high risk population. So if you go back to that four quadrant slide and we're talking about those bottom two categories, those are individuals that we know have high needs, and you would assume that if we have high needs that we, they probably need primary care more often, or they need the help coordinating services. And so we just took a snapshot and we said, well, what did it look like for individuals with Medicare insurance who were in those high-risk categories in June of 2018, which was very early days in our complex care coordination program, compared it to June of 2019, and we see about a 6% increase. That makes sense to us because of the interventions and activities that we are really promoting in our local communities. And that includes things like having those SASH wellness nurses check and make sure that um, clients in their congregate housing are actually seeing their provider every year. It includes thinking about um, how home health is communicating with primary care about how, when there's a specific need or an opportunity. Yeah. I think it'd be really helpful together to also be looking at those percentages, uh, the, the access issue for commercial insurance, because that's where we see the that's, people that's who the have issues, really high yes. deductibles yeah, just, because they're, yeah. yeah so, I would just, so, I would just I, to underscore that, that when, when you think about the issues of affordability, and I think the, uh, you know, 
Office of the Healthcare Advocate is releasing, you know, just an analysis of the comments from uh, uh, people in terms of the hearings at the Green Mountain Care Board. And I mean, affordability is is a, is the issue that is layered over on top of the access. If you don't have affordability, you don't have access. And so, I'm looking at Medicaid affordability. Yeah, these are not, not surprising. Not, not not an issue. Medicare less an issue. Private insurance huge issue. And so I think there needs to be some kind of uh, understanding of how, how this all fits together as well. And I would say that I think that there will be a great opportunity for us to look at this, this this year because as you've seen in previous years, our number of commercially insured lives has been relatively low. Um, so we could really evaluate that a lot further this year with MVP coming on and us expanding our Blue Cross Blue Shield program. It's a great comment. So the Senate I, is just about to leave. So okay. uh, keep going, and then we'll leave individually as we feel. Perfect. Um, this is actually a great note. Um, okay. If you have to depart to leave on, I would love you to leave with these two numbers in mind. <laughs> so we can talk a lot about our complex care coordination program and how we're supporting individuals, but it's also our accountability to look at the population that we're supporting that agreed to engage in this program and what is their care and what are their outcomes looking like. This is a first snapshot when we had individuals that had been in care coordination for at least six months. We said, what is it looking like in terms of their utilization of the emergency room? Because that's one of the first things we would hope would improve um, before we see costs go down and, and other things. And so what we saw is that there was a 33% reduction in utilization of the emergency department for those who are in the care management program with Medicaid, excuse me, with Medicare insurance, and a 13% reduction for those with Medicaid. And I do want to note that those are statistically significant changes because sometimes you have to think about, well, is the population big enough to really say these are impactful? And in fact, there are quite uh, pretty dramatic differences in those rates. We continue to track these as well as other measures on an ongoing basis and we'll be happy to share more information about the program or about the outcomes that we're starting to see. Final slide here, um, also related to care coordination, is around a pilot program that began with UVM Health Pet Network Home Health and Hospice. They used some of the funding that we provided them through the care coordination program and they developed what they call a longitudinal care program. And what they saw with a small group of patients, this is roughly about 30 individuals, is that by continuing to provide home health support after a typical <coughs> episode of care would end, so normally they would have lost their ability to access uh, home health services. Instead, through One Care Funding, we extended that for very um, frail and, and particular conditions. What they saw is a 30% reduction in cost so about $1,150 reduction per member per month in that group. Uh, a 26% reduction in admissions to the hospital and about a 20% reduction in ED utilization. This was so impressive to us in a short period that this is one of the uses for delivery system reform funds that we are hoping to invest in in 2020 to be able to spread this to other rural areas of the state and see whether they can achieve these same outcomes. And as we see these reductions, um, and cost uh, and utilization, utilization resulting in uh, cost reduction. Um, what are you looking at in the future? Uh, how can we look at this, I guess is a better question. How can we look at this as a cost reduction to the individual patient? I mean, right now we're looking at the overall system and the public health, but how can we look at this as a benefit to the patient to reduce out of pocket or deductibles and you know the copay whole piece is so problematic for folks. I mean, in the big picture, what we're doing here is the hospitals are pre-investing about $10 million mm -hmm. in 2020 in this program in order to uh, support the 700 plus individuals across the continuum of care that are providing these services. But as services go down, as they stay out of the hospital, there should be a, a corresponding reduction in some of those out-of-pocket expenses. That's kind of the first layer of where we might see it. And then the, then the next question becomes, how do we start to change other aspects of the way that care is organized and delivered? And I think that's where new creative thinking needs to happen, frankly. Oh, we're, we've got it. 
<laughs> well, thank you for that. But, but it isn't that you're not thinking about that. No. I mean, th this is important for, I think, us to understand. And one of our focus areas this year is to really look at all the programs that we're investing in because they're a pretty stable portfolio right now and evaluating those core metrics of success. And that'll be part of the performance dashboard that we're developing in collaboration with the Green Mountain Care Board to understand what those metrics are and how we are moving the dial towards those uh, loftier goals of the Altair model. Before I start using people, I just really want to thank uh, both the Senate and the House for allowing us to have so much of your time over the last few days. I hope that you found this helpful, and I think, as you know, we're all available. If you ever have any questions or things come up, or if you want any of us to come back and do a deeper dive, we're, we're happy to do that. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your time and all your staff. I mean, I know there are others who haven't spoken who are here, and we're very appreciative of the time you've given us. Thank you. So I think we're we're going to finish. We're going to wrap it up for the house as well, and we'll. Okay. Um, thank you. Back. Yes, we're back. Yeah, so we'll okay. Back to right. committee thank shortly. You. Thank you. Safe trips.